And now a session with CEO Visit Greenland, Jota Smarason, in discussion with SCIF CEO Rafet Ali. So, um, so we have a surprise speaker. The 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 speaker from Wizz Air. She uh, could not um, come and speak. I think um, she. Um, I don't know if I should say this. I don't know if she has COVID or not. But she has something, so she's not able to uh, to come. So what we decided is we we're going to pull the person from uh, from the audience who has the hardest pronunciation of all <laughs> to say, come on stage, because we're going to butcher your name, and you're going to hate us by the end of this. Uh, so pronounce your name again for all of us. Hjörtur. Hjörtur, OK. Yes. So um, Icelandic name. Um, we just had on stage 20 minutes ago two countries, 90 million tourists and 94 million tourists. And you are bigger than both of them put together, correct? We are bigger than both of them put together, plus the UK, plus Germany. In terms of size? Yes. Not in terms of number of tourists? Not quite. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me, 100,000 tourists? Yes. 107 in a good year. 107 in a good year. So um, the reason I want Greenland um, on stage to talk to you is you are, when people talk about climate change, you are living it. You're in the middle of it. You're seeing it. Yeah. You are giving some... Uh, examples. Give some examples of like how are you seeing it in your daily lives in front of your eyes. Yeah, it's it, it's quite extreme. I mean, uh, uh, Greenland, as probably most of you know, that's usually why people hear about Greenland is because because of climate change. Uh, we're seeing the uh, ice sheets melting um, three times the average temperature rise is what we're seeing in, in Greenland. So people are really feeling it, and we're talking about people there who uh, live from nature. So any change in nature really affects their life. Um, hunters and fishermen who cannot hunt and fish the same way they used to. And if we take as an example I mentioned to you earlier today, uh, on the east coast, the sea ice, uh, where the sea freezes in the wintertime, is now 800 kilometers further north than it used to be just 20 to 30 years ago. Mm. And to put that into context, that's like if the sea ice was in London 30 years ago, but now it, it's in Berlin. That's the distance we are talking about, the sea ice that has disappeared in the last 30 years. So, of course, it has a huge impact on, on uh, life in the country. So, I, some would say that that open, well, opens up, metaphorically and literally, the country for more tourism. It does. Meaning it does. The, the thawing of the ice all the metaphors, which are actually real things, not even just metaphors yep. in, in, in Greenland, are, um, that's the reason why there's so much interest in Greenland for minerals and, and mining and stuff, which I know you are uh, holding at bay in many ways. Um, does, that make, does that make you make your job easier in a long term, not like just in? It's, it's an interesting challenge uh, because of course, it's hard to sell a country where you need to fly to on the basis of the story that it's the epicenter of climate change, which is the um, consequences of us flying too much and using too much. Um, so how do we solve that? And uh, I, I come from Iceland originally, where we had a similar uh, yeah. challenge with the Eyjafjallajökull yeah. eruption, just to add more difficult words here. Uh, <laughs> But we managed to turn that a, a, a negative event into a positive story. Mm -hmm. And I think um, it's the same approach we do have in Greenland. So yes, it's a negative story, but it catches the attention of the media. Mm. And we try to get the focus away from just the eyes and towards the people that live there. So who are the people who are living in Greenland and what are they experiencing and how are they adapting? And Greenlanders have, uh, through thousands of years, been the experts in adapting to extreme climates. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, you know, using the dog sled to travel on the ice, using the kayak, uh, that's a Greenlandic invention, um, to, to, to fish. And, and, and uh, today they are leading the way when it comes to adaptation to extreme climate changes. And so one of the options when uh, your livelihood is, is maybe disappearing because of climate change, uh, that's tourism. So can we build tourism instead that creates jobs in the small settlements and, uh, and some opportunities for the youngsters? Um, who maybe don't want to go, they want to stay there, but uh, they, they can't live the same life as their, their fathers and mothers. 
So, um, you know, if you talk to a lot of tourism heads, a lot of their time is spent talking to airlines to start airline routes. Yeah. But you don't, you, you can't do that. Well, we do, but we try to be very selective on it. Um, because when we think about, I, I compare, of course, Greenland to Iceland right, a lot. Right. And if we think about the development there, a lot happened when we got all the new airlines in. Right. Uh, and you have EasyJet and Ryanair and Visa flying from the UK to, to Iceland. And that makes sense because you can rent a car and all of a sudden we had 200,000 new cars in, in Iceland for, for, for rentals. Mm -hmm. You can't do that in Greenland. There are no roads in Greenland. So, so you can't just rent a car. You land at the airport and if that's your plan, you're never going to leave the airport. Um, so no two towns in Greenland are connected by road. You need to travel by plane, by helicopter, by boat or by dock sled. So it puts limitations on how you can travel and it adds on to the cost. So it means that we need to go for a specific segment that both has the means to pay for these modes of transportation and is also willing to face the challenges that come with traveling in, in this way. Because it is more challenging, but it's also very, very rewarding. Mm -hmm. And so um, you said you're building two new airports because capacity isn't there. Yes, correct. So currently we have one international airport in a place called Kangalusuak, an airport built by the US Army in, in World War II. Fantastic location for an airport. Um, but the main destinations are Nuuk, the capital, and the town called Dilulisat, where you have the giant icebergs, which is probably the tourist picture you see the most uh, from Speaking Greenland. Speaking of which, we forgot the best thing, right? We had to show the videos and the photos. Yeah, yeah, let's take a look at that yeah. if we can. A dad, my father, he taught me to hunt to read the landscape, to understand the nature, to talk to the dogs, to adapt to the extreme climate. But things are changing. The animals are migrating. The glacier is melting. The ice is not secure anymore. Times are changing, and yet again, we need to start a journey into the unknown. So just to give a sense of the sort of the desolateness of the of the place in general, is um, pardon me, but is the population decreasing or increasing? The population has been the same for years now, and to put it in the context, we talked about how big Greenland is earlier. There are fifty six thousand people living in all of Greenland. Mm. If every New Yorker had the same space uh, as Greenlanders do, there would be two people in New York. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I live in Queens, Astoria, which is a, which is a neighborhood. I have more people probably within uh, a mile of where I live than 56,000 people. Yeah. Um, so in terms of, I know you did a campaign uh, during the pandemic. I remember you won a Skift Award as well, I think if I remember right, um, Skift Idea Award, um, on um, trying to get locals to travel. Yes, That was correct. a campaign video called Flatten the Curve. We have actually the, the author of, of the script there. Of the script there. Yeah. Um, so, um, so explain, obviously, with a very small country, uh, small population. Yep. Uh, was there any domestic tourism before? Very little. Um, also because it costs the same in many cases to travel uh, domestically as it costs to travel out of the country. So people very often, you know, that was the natural choice. Um, but now people have been discovering that uh, their own home country can be a fantastic destination. And uh, I, th I think many countries can, can relate to that. Yeah. Uh, and in our case, uh, um, the population is 56,000. So it did have an impact for tourism industry because uh, uh, we have such low numbers uh, beforehand. Right. Um, if anybody has any questions, please use the app. Uh, I'll be happy to take a few questions. Um, in terms of makeup of the current 107,000 tourists, we were talking a little earlier, um, obviously Danish yeah. uh, tourists are probably the, the large majority of it? Yes, that's the biggest group, clearly. Uh, then we have Germans, uh, Brits, and Americans. Uh, these are the biggest group that are coming. And um, who do, are you thinking about Like, which countries would you like to attract more? I know you don't do traditional marketing. Explain yeah. how you do marketing. We primarily focus on, on uh, journalists. It's because we have very, very low budgets. I mean, it, it's, it's like we're not even half the size of Fargo in the US. 
um, when it comes to population. So um, uh, we focus on, on journalism, we focus on getting the right stories out there, and preferably stories that attract the right people and maybe scare others away. Because we don't want everyone, we, we, we don't have we the capacity have for it. Everyone, yeah. No. yeah, we were, this, uh, the back anecdote is that we um, do a retreat every year, and we were thinking of um, talking to you to come this year. We uh, had not been going for the last two years. And then uh, we were about 60, 60 plus people, but you just don't have the capacity to, uh, to bring 60 people in a group. So we, we're yeah, not It's a challenge. There, but hopefully at some point. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so in terms of, um, so you don't have any marketing budgets, traditional marketing budgets in the way that. It's, it's very, very low. Um, so it's, it's, it's minimal. We, we use that in the Danish market, which is like our, our main market. And, uh, but otherwise we focus on, yeah, um, influences and journalists and getting the right stories out to the right people. And for us, it's, it's very important when we think about uh, how to develop tourism, because uh, as I said earlier, climate change is the big story, and then you need to fly there. So it, it creates this, this contradiction. I mean, everyone is talking about fly shaming. Uh, so how does that impact? And particularly in the, in the Nordics and stuff. It's in the Nordics, bigger, yeah. bigger thing. Yeah, it, it does, and that's, that's our core market. Um, so, but we have a few things that are going for us. First of all, uh, we focus on sustainability. That's the core of everything we do. It's the core of, of pretty much uh, most of the things that the government is doing at the moment. But it's the core of living there. It's, it's the core of living. I mean, I mean, that's how you survive. So the current government was voted in to stop uh, uh, uranium mining in the country and focus on, on other possibilities, which is tourism. Uh, they've, uh, signed the Paris Agreement. They were the first Arctic nation to uh, uh, stop oil and, and gas exploration. So they're really taking big steps towards sustainability. But it's also important for us to think about uh, what does sustainability mean in a Greenlandic context? If we think, if we ask a, a German person, you know, how, how is a sustainable lifestyle? Uh, one of the things will be, I'm a vegetarian. Um, but that's maybe the wrong way to think about it because there's no vegetables that will grow in You can't grow any vegetables in Greenland. So we're eating sustainably is eat, eating whale meat, <laughs> for one thing. It's usually not something you, you connect to it. Mm -hmm. uh, or reindeer or muscus ox or, or the local fish uh, and stuff like that. Um, and secondly, uh, we ask ourselves all the time, why are we doing this? Why do we want tourists? And of course, we want tourists to create job opportunities for the youngsters, mm -hmm. uh, possibilities to maintain the settlements. Uh, you see the dog sled here in, in the picture. Uh, dog sledding is, is a, a very, very old tradition. It, it's been part of the, the life of the locals for, what, 6,000 years or something like that. But we're seeing, like, um, there were 35,000 dogs in 1990. Now there are 15,000 left because the ice is disappearing. So more than half of the dogs have disappeared. And we see tourism as a way to maintain uh, the knowledge that is uh, behind the dog sledding culture. So uh, sustainability is also about uh, social sustainability. Uh, how do we uh, get tourism to, to support the local economies and the local communities uh, be inclusive and, and to create opportunities and, and sense of ownership? So um, I, know, I guess there are a couple of cruises. Uh, are the cruises coming to Greenland? Yes, they love Greenland. So, <laughs> but but the, does Greenland love them? Um, there is a good relationship, and uh, for me, this was relatively new, and and I've, I've come to understand that I may have had some prejudice against crews. Uh, there are very different levels and different scales. We focus on uh, in, in our marketing. We try to attract expedition ships, and expedition ships are smaller cruise ships, usually under five hundred passengers. Um, and there, there you have passengers that leave much more with the local com communities. Um, we can better uh, handle that uh, number of people when they come ashore. Um, so it makes a lot more sense. And like there with, with everything else, we are trying to grow tourism in Greenland. We are trying to create new opportunities, get new cruises, get new hotels. Uh, but in every case, it's sustainability that, that needs to be the key. So if we are getting a new hotel, we don't want uh, a Las Vegas style hotel uh, with loads of rooms and, and uh, affordable uh, accommodation. What we're looking at is we would love to see an international chain, but then it should be someone who's building the, the flagship hotel when it comes to sustainability. And as you see here, this is our, our long-term goal, becoming one of the leading sustainable destinations in the world. And 
you were comparing us to uh, uh, France and Spain earlier with 90 and 95 million uh, tourists. For them to become sustainable, su sustainable, it's a huge challenge. For us who are starting from scratch, it's much easier because we, we have like tabula rasa, it's a blank canvas. Right. And if all the investment we get into tourism in the country is in the direction of sustainability, we actually have a competitive advantage and we have a very, very good chance of achieving this in just a matter of few years. Um, you've also, uh, you, we were talking a little bit backstage, focused a little bit on the, f so um, since you come from Iceland, one of the challenges when Iceland was first rising um, after, the, after yeah. the volcano or like right around that time was that they had to develop the F&B and like food and restaurant because they just didn't have enough beyond their local cuisine. Um, how are you thinking about that? Um, we are encouraging people to look more at, at restaurants. Luckily, we have very good examples. Um, of course, Noma in Copenhagen is an inspiration in all of the Nordics, including right. Greenland, yeah. uh, which was the best restaurant in the world, focusing on, on local ingredients. Um, we've seen what has happened in, in Iceland, and it's worked really well. And Faroe Islands as well. And the Faroe Islands as well. So we're getting new restaurants, and, and the... the Greenlandic raw materials are absolutely fantastic. I mean, it's, it's, it's the freshest, cleanest food right. you can get. Right. Uh, and now we're getting Cox, the Michelin restaurant from uh, uh, Fair Islands, right, is yeah. moving to Greenland, which is absolutely fantastic. So we really look forward to see. And you think uh, that will be a, like, um, you, can, you will see the boost in tourism? I, or a certain type? I, I don't think we'll necessarily see a boost in tourism. We will certainly attract uh, a new segment. Uh, but one of the things that we will see, which I'm pretty certain about, is uh, um, uh, like, like a ripple effect. Uh, people will, will uh, other restaurants will learn from it and inspire from it. And again, if we take Noma and Copenhagen as an example, before Noma was opened up in Copenhagen, uh, the culinary scene in Copenhagen was pretty much hot dogs and, and frikadella. <laughs> Not really exciting, yeah. but all of a sudden, people were flying in in private jets yeah. to eat at Noma. And uh, it, it built up a reputation of being a gastronomical destination. Uh, so it put pressure on other restaurants to uh, uh, raise the bar and uh, uh, be inspired and, and uh, offer better food. So I expect the same to happen in Greenland, that uh, other restaurants will be inspired from it. And they'll see that you can actually have a restaurant in a very remote location. Uh, I mean, you, you need to take usually three flights to get there, plus a boat ride, and you need to stay overnight to get to the restaurant. It's extremely remote, mm. uh, but a fantastic experience and totally unique. Is it open yet? It opens uh, June 12th, if I recall correctly. Okay. But you can start booking. <laughs> um, question from, from Jason. What destinations do you look to for ideas, creativities that you can learn from? Uh, we luckily don't need to uh, go far to search for inspiration. Uh, both Iceland and the Faroe Islands have been doing a fantastic job, mm -hmm. uh, both in terms of uh, uh, product development, but also in terms of their marketing yeah, and how they use PR. Really yeah. Idea, yeah. So that's excellent. And we have close collaboration with them. Um, so we seek a lot of inspiration from them. Uh, otherwise, it's... Would uh, you not want to learn from Iceland? Um, because you know, Iceland has gone through challenges as well. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. And uh, I have in my slideshow a picture of a sign from a farmer in Iceland with a picture of uh, you know, with a red circle and, and a red line over it, and it's a tourist pooping, mm. which uh, was a problem because uh, Iceland wasn't ready for the influx of tourists, uh, and uh, they came too fast, um, and it created this sense of, of mass tourism. And uh, mass tourism is not the volume of tourists that comes, it's a management issue. You know, how, how, how much capacity can you build? And because it came so suddenly in Iceland, uh, Iceland wasn't ready. In Greenland, we are opening up the new airports. Uh, the first season will be 2025. So we have three years to prepare. Okay. So we're looking at micro infrastructure. Uh, um, so pathways, um, parking uh, spots, uh, toilet facilities, service facilities, um, uh, small harbors uh, or, or, or landing spots for boats, etc. Uh, that helps us spread the tourists because the land is big enough. There's no, enough room for everyone. Right. We just make, to sh make sure that they can get they away. Can get there. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you. I think we're right out of time. And thank you for doing this last, last second. We really thank you. appreciate thank it. You. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you.